The scroll was a letter of surrender, abdicating the armory tower of Castle Domara and all the embassies it commanded. The letter was an archaic formality, a bureaucratic solution to an antiquated problem, a holdover from a time when the daughters of Nier wrestled with each other for control within a loose confederacy, and before there was a distinction between Duchess and Dane. Once upon a time, there were only tyrants, and they never surrendered. They only died. Letting go of this letter felt like death. Dame Brienne clutched the scroll tighter to her heart, still unable to relinquish. Prince Lunarier did not avert his eyes as tears welled in hers. Instead, he held her gaze, kept hers in his, held her for that moment. He also did not withdraw his open hand. It waited patiently for as long as she needed. It was a kindness she knew he could fake, but she needed kindness at that moment more than sincerity. She let the letter fall from his hand to his, then let herself collapse into humiliation. She clutched herself, but could not hold herself up as her knees gave beneath her. Her teeth bit back at a scream, yet still a whimper managed to escape. She wanted to turn back time, but succeeded only in turning away. Lunarier tossed the scroll to catch her instead. He swept her into his arms and forced her to turn back to him. He pressed her head to his shoulder, and surrendered his sleeve to her tears. She did not need knees. He would keep her standing. It was a long time before Brienne could at last compose a question. What did I do wrong? She whispered into his chest. Nothing. A thousand year history, never once has Domara fallen, and now the first letter of surrender is signed Dame Brienne. You were preparing for a move anyway. Brienne pushed the prince off of her. That is different. I was going to Castle Osmara. I designed the damn thing. Those ports. That double ward. And you will sit in a big chair in a big room to deal with small problems. Tarasam is a real disaster. The port is huge and poorly managed, rife with the exact problems you squashed to claw your way to Dame. Lunarier made up the distance she had put between them, raked her curls between his fingers to take her head and aim her gaze at his. This is not a demotion. This is using the right tool for the job. This is Dame Brienne doing what she does best. Doing my best is not getting me what I want. Is it supposed to? You're not even going to miss me when I'm gone. That is not true. You're not going to miss me like I will miss you. Maybe, Lunarier smirked. Sincerity at last? She touched his hips. He clutched her closer. She rested her brow against his chest. He was there for her, but he would not be there for her. She surrendered with a sigh. A knock at the open door knocked Brienne and Lunaria apart. Brienne combed out her hair with her hands to regain some illusion of composure. Yes, what is it? Reporting evening roll call, General. She nodded, and the warlock at the door continued. Third shift stations are manned. Only one guard is on a double, and she's been moved to Central Ward. The castle is bound southwest, very low winds from the west. The crown is retired. Very good, Lieutenant. I will be available for another half hour, then defer to Major Bethany. On your way. The warlock clicked his heels in deference. Hold up, Lunarier interrupted. Lieutenant and he reeled his hand to fish for an answer. Terracon, the lieutenant offered with a bow and a click of his heels. Lunarier crept past Terracon and slid the door something more like shut, but not so much as to let the lock drop. He then turned back to Terracon. What are they saying in the mess hall? Terracon was hesitant, but Lunarier pressed with an eager grin. You get a chance now to help us. Nobody is getting blamed. We just need a sense of it. Do not answer that, Brienne scowled at Lunarier. He was playing his usual games. Do answer that, Lunarier dared, then looked back at Brienne. Come on, Bree. You're going to have to lead them. I'm not asking for myself. Well, all right, maybe a little, but you need to know. His Highness turned back to the lieutenant. What are they saying? 
Terracon looked at Brienne. Brienne looked at Terracon, but found he was already waiting on her move. It was her turn. She had to make a play. It was Lunaria's curiosity, not hers. He could have the information. She did not need it. She turned away. It was not her business. She does not need you to follow her, soldier. Lunaria dared the lieutenant. Focus on the mission. Do not save her. Stave off the enemy. Terracon did not take nearly as long in making his move. They are ready to saddle. I am ready to saddle. They have served as garrison long enough. The Order of Renelia need defend no armory tower. We will be the first battalion to charge under the Crescent Banner. A cackle burst from Lunarier. He picked the scroll up from the floor and teased it before Brienne. Well, how about that, Brienne? No need for a tower, eh? Guess this will be the last one you'll ever need to write. Brienne's clenched teeth were now caging back a grin rather than a holler. Get gone, she huffed to disguise a laugh and elbowed the prince away from her. He tripped back from her with a hearty cackle, gave a gracious acknowledgement to the soldiers before stepping through the door, then let the hallway echo with one last laugh before he could be considered as having actually left. Go ahead, you too, Terracon. In fact, count me out for tonight. I'm done. Terracon excused himself to his duties. There was a syncopation between her doubts and aspirations, which caused an arrhythmic flutter in her heart. She paced in an attempt to work through her nerves, but the rhythmic clacking of her heels was not loud enough to drown out or distract from the cacophony of caveats and suggestions being made to no one's benefit. There had been a time when she would have acted on the opportunities and quelled the dissatisfaction. The previous attempts, however, had had unanticipated repercussions. The scowl Osmara had worn throughout her pregnancy with Draco was so stubborn that it marred her countenance permanently thereafter. Disappointed to have lost her youthful polish, she attempted a more cunning coping mechanism while expecting Merkiner. This had also failed her, however, as she found her moods had been inherited. Merkiner was too suspicious to suckle, and Draco's penchant to violently guard his pride had, in retrospect, been a fault rather than a merit. Granted, their respective careers in diplomacy and battle had been served by their characters, but that did not free their mother from the burden of knowing her moods had afflicted them during their gestation. In her time with Lunarier, she maintained a chipper composure. In his time, Lunarier's charms and amiable manners practically invited trouble. With the sole objective of escape, and with her countermaneuvers succeeding until now only in further penning her, Osmar acquiesced to the unusual option of surrender. She could accept that the curse had not been, and would not be, fair to the character of her bastards, and so it was easy to not try, and to let it take responsibility for the consequences, only as long as it resulted in a daughter by whom the dynasty of Nier could continue. Lacking direction, she was left with inspiration and whim. She threw herself onto her bed, whose curtains cast lacy shadows against her skin. She scowled out of desire, slithered onto her knees, then crawled off the bed. Quiet obedience was how Osmara would deal with the madness, certain that it was the will of the Tawesh, and it was her duty to endure whatever burden the Tawesh favored. Her dutiful outlook could not inspire her to delight in it, however. She could hear it growing inside of her, snapping open like branches under the weight of ice, hatching, creaking as it stretched. She could feel it nesting, nuzzling, often just pressing, soft like a pillow, but occasionally pricking, as if squeezing a loaded pincushion. It cried in her womb, whimpering for a help Osmara could not provide. She did not yet show, and had as of not yet told her vizier, she needed to be alone with it, to meditate on its wails in the hope she could make out what it wanted, and thereby determine what same supernatural inequity she felt in her own existence. She understood that there was not supposed to be a singular topic, but she thought she was supposed to be content with the passing thoughts. Instead, she lamented the loss of each notion that slipped from her complete comprehension. Her mind kept flipping from subject to subject, 
as if she were reading a book whose pages were fluttering in the wind. Curiosity kept reaching out, but she dared not let it latch onto anything. She would rather endure the hunger than let it feed. This clamoring had kept Osmara distracted all day. She could recall little of what had been said in court, and was comfortable with her prejudice that the nobles were over-dramatizing the dilemma. The fairies had only been a nuisance in the past. Certainly there were other, more pressing matters. Osmara's stomach then churned at her apathy. People were being plagued by fairies. Their babies, born through arduous labors, were being changed by the fae. Mothers would suckle pixies disguised to look like their children, while the infants robbed of their mother's milk would waste away in their cribs. Osmara curled over her own still narrow belly and the babe forming within. No more, she thought. Leave the progeny be. The setting sun had painted the winter evening with vibrant shades of pink. The encroaching night whistled zephyrs through the window to distract Osmara. Freed from the aimless rotation of her carousel of nightmares, Osmara refreshed herself with a deep breath of cold evening air. Half a breath later, Osmara tumbled across the marble-tiled floor. Whatever invisible cords kept the floating castle of Domara suspended among the clouds now strained to keep the levitating island from capsizing. Towers roared as they crumbled. The screams of their residents were muffled by the rubble. Osmara's eyes opened from an unconscious black, but still she could not see. The air was thick with dust. The opaque billows soaked up the waning sunlight to blot the room out with an ambient haze. Osmara propped herself to sit on a hip, and she perused the smog for some indication of an escape. Nothing, however, could be discerned. An abrupt stop. Whoever spoke was right. The suspended castle's aerial course had been distracted. The levitating fortress was now caught adrift in the same stratospheric jet streams which had once beaten against its walls. Who is there? Osmara cried out. I am not hurt, but I cannot find my way. Your way? The whisper sighed into a superficial silence, and the air bristled with anticipation for the next word. Osmara bristled with paranoia. She could not see who was talking or discern what had happened. Comfortable that the floor was not going to give way beneath her, and insistent on resolving her predicament, Osmara stood up. She pursed her lips and blew into the pollution. The breeze bore through the haze, churned the dust, whirled it out of the way. Measure by measure the room was revealed until the wind crashed into and was diffused by a distant silhouette. Osmara guessed her eyes were scratched by too much dust or tricked by the dim, polluted light, for the figure looked to stand no higher than her hip. The tenebrous form was curvaceous. Its narrow waist was contrasted by corpulent thighs. An ankle, too narrow to support its frame, peeked out from the murky clouds. Delicately, it placed its toe to the floor. It stepped forward. Reflexes fired through the sinews, and it swam out of the darkness. Its approach was lithe. Its pointed toes spiked the floor with each stalked step of its approach. Pendulous breasts swayed from her huddled, hunched posture, but she slithered erect as she neared. Within a moment, she had sauntered right up to glower at Osmar with a pair of gawking, oil-black eyes revealed from beneath the lobed brim of a leaf cap. My way! Concluding her previous sentiment revved the humming air into a roaring tempest. A vacuum of gasping winds funneled up the fog. The billows were whirled into strands and sipped off by the currents of the barreling eddy of air. The dust drained out through the cracks that crawled across the walls. The waning sunlight pierced the thinning clouds of dust. Osmar's bedroom was again illuminated. Everything was strewn. The canopy bed had been crushed beneath collapsed timbers. The shattered mirror spilled splinters beneath its toppled frame. The green glass that had once paned the windows now jutted like teeth from the sills. The only thing in the room still standing was the queen's assailant. Osmara had seen a frame like hers before, and had seen that shade of celadon complexion with its sopping, glossy luster. This was not the first time that aroma of damp, pillowy loam, accented with the sour, bitter bouquets of moss and mold, had wafted past her. 
This was a pixie, just one of the menagerie classified in the phylum fae. Knowing all of this did not, however, explain how the pixie had gotten so close to the queen. With the pixie's fists tightly clenched at Osmara's collar, the queen could do little but resign herself to instinct, a feral condition which fairies found ripe for sowing.